what will Christmas be without light? Without the lights hung around the room. Without the lights adding sprinkles of color around the city. Lights that glow under the moon telling silent stories. But our story cannot be told without light. In the beginning, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. But evil arose. The first betrayer occurred. The first broken heart. The first broken relationship. The fig leaves could not hide the darkness. The idols are still yet to rain down fire. And the darkness lasted through the night. Where is the joy? Where is the morning? Hope was formless and empty. But after years, years of silence, years of waiting, years of darkness, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Rejoice today because the people living in darkness have seen a great light. Rejoice today because the light shines and darkness will never overcome it. Joy to you today who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. You who shall receive the city that does not need the moonlight and the sun. Will you rejoice and join heaven to sing? Will you prepare your hearts to receive your King, the light of the world, your light and salvation? Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Joy.
Great way to start this year's carol, Joy to the World. I want to welcome everybody to Im and Noel 3. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome, welcome, welcome. We'd love you to know more about us and to check us out. And we'd also love to know a little bit about you. So if you're new, please click in the description box below for us to connect. It's been a particularly stressful year, one kind of a year. How dare we sing Joy to the World? The world is being eaten with a pandemic. Our country was hit with a massacre. And I, I think that we all have personal stories of how 2020 was, was a big hit. I read a story recently of a man. He said their son Nick went to play basketball and the next call they got was that he had died. And at that point, it made me realize that even life can be taken away from me. And I think 2020, we've lost someone, we've lost one thing or the other. And I think that this has made us realize what really matters, what we have that can never, ever, ever, not even 2020, can take away from us. Romans 14, 8 says, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. So we may lose our lives, but we cannot lose our souls. We may lose money, but Christ is still our treasured possession. And we may go through difficulties here, but it is nothing compared to the inheritance and the glory that awaits. And that is the reason why we can rejoice. Our Advent series leading up to this moment said, He is coming. But people, we can rejoice because our King is here. Our Shepherd is here. Christ, our possession, is here. He was born and therefore we rejoice. So with joy still brimming in our hearts, let's say a word of prayer together. Lord, we thank you for coming to this world to redeem us. When we think of the extent to which you went to save us, it makes us want to celebrate, to burst forth out in praise, and to be filled with gratitude. Lord, thank you for the gift of Emmanuel. As we run through this service, Lord, we ask that we will share in the songs of the angels, the gladness of the shepherds, and the worship of the wise men. Lord, we pray that you make Christmas real in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People, it is time. That time that you have been waiting for, it is now. It is time for the professional singers, the men singers, and the bad singers to sing together with one voice. Or oh, now, maybe it's not one voice anymore now. But please, gather everybody around you. Gather everyone in your family, respective of their singing status. And let us sing together about Christ's birth. If you get cut off from the video, please try and refresh. If it doesn't work, please try again. But if there's no road... Please, you can join the audio-only app, that's the Mixler app, as we run through this service. All right, we'll be singing Ark the Air Out and a song, Oyen Zoputa, that takes us back to Eden. And then we'll be having a Bible reading, and we will see how Christmas goes down in a family. See ya. Let's all sing together. Ark the Herald Angels sing.
Bible reading is taken from the book of John chapter 6 verse 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. My King, my Savior. Start from Eden, man was made. To reflect the love of God Satan came and made him sin In one step man's faith was sealed But through the love and grace of God He will always come for him Too bad again From Abraham to David's sons The tabernacle coming down
I think I'm looking forward to a quiet Christmas. Maybe I could still have a few friends come around, but more of a quiet Christmas to reflect and really be grateful that we're still alive. Um, um, what was your best part of last Christmas? Uh, the best part of last Christmas for me is perhaps that part that we're not sure we're going to have this year, which is the hanging around with friends, visiting friends, playing games, having fun, we did all of that last year and, and, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, 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 I hope we will have some form of it this year. Diane, if your Christmas tree was what do you think you going to say? My Christmas tree would tell me that whoever believes that Santa is real, he's not real. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody, how do you celebrate Christmas as a family? Well, as a tradition, we always wrap presents that we buy and then hide them under the Christmas tree. And on the 26th of December, we always have to open our presents. So yeah. another thing we do is, everybody buys a gift for the other person. So like, I'll have three gifts, so that's how it is. And then everybody sneaks in, wraps it so that nobody sees it, and then sneaks it under the Christmas tree. One other thing that we do at Christmas is we play lots of Christmas carols in the house. It's that time when uh, we get to sing together. We love this a cappella group, Pentatonics. We play lots of uh, their carols at Christmas and then we get to watch Christmas movies together the family. My favorite part of Christmas last year was sitting up the Christmas tree. Alright, so family Christmas song challenge. Sing Jingle Bells. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in one horse open sleigh. And then the snow in one horse open sleigh. All those who jingle. All the way. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Christmas family tradition. I don't know whether you was involved. Um, you know, everybody gathering around the tree, decorating it, and then Christmas morning you unwrap your presents. Or if it was my like mine, where it was just typical Christmas clothes, you cannot miss out Christmas clothes. And you don't want to know those gowns. It had puff puff hands, then it had the had an elastic band attached to it. It was it was epic. And but if you can, please as a family celebrate and talk about what Christmas means to you as a family. And moving on, we'll still be singing, and then we'd also have the second Bible reading and then a testimony. Join us as we sing together our way in the manger.
Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Thank you. 
my first um, memory of feeling in inadequate or not good enough is um, when I saw my results, second term, primary six results, and I came 19th out of about 38 people. It was unbelievable because before now, now, before this time, I was used to being either first, second, or third. You know, that was the, those were the positions I was used to. In fact, I was going to be the head girl of my school. That's the former school, I, the, the school I was in before the school where I came in for primary six. My mom took me out of there and felt the school wasn't good enough. So, uh, that, and they were going to make me a head girl, you know, like, a village headmaster or something like that so uh, she took me out and here I was and um, because uh, my mom uh, is a very optimistic person and in my house a lot of optimism and she, everybody's like okay yeah now that you see it you can do better and you know I planned to do better you know and second term I came 13th I still couldn't believe it like we that, you know, so that was the first time that I was feeling some people are really like the best and I'm not one of them. I went into secondary school with this feeling and I developed uh, a lot of my talents, you know, so I, I knew, I, so by this time I knew I wasn't like one of the best academically, but I was pretty good. And so as I take in a lot of the other skills that I had or talents gave me the confidence, you know, and so like that to university and now in university i really put my best into my work and i still came out with a grade i wasn't proud of at all i mean i was looking forward to being an inspirational person and i felt one of the things that um, you needed to be as someone who could inspire other people was to do well with whatever you had or any any task that you had to do so i was used to being an example and i felt this won't make me an example so that that's really took a big blow on my confidence level but then i went on and you know i told you i'm from uh, a very <laughs> I have a very optimistic background you know in my family it's all positivity you know you can do this and we had really seen God do some things for us in my family you know so financially and we felt we could do anything so okay third class <gasps> I said it's yeah so like well and my parents gave me all this advice they came with all their talks so it's our fault that you made it third class you could have you know you wanted to change your course and they mentioned Ganifawa and me and some other people you know who were doing so very well and okay I said okay I can okay it doesn't matter so at some point um, in my teenage years I was um, kind of sure of what I was going to do the kind of work I was going to do but I started this work and at some point when we moved to Lagos, you know, uh, this work that gave me so much, um, what would I say, you know, so much goodwill, um, a, a kind of work that uh, people like that I was doing this work, a, a work that um, was a blessing to humanity. I came to Lagos and I started feeling dumb because this work didn't materialize into material possessions of, you know, being really buoyant financially. So at some point I started feeling like, it's maybe, maybe it's because of the grade I had in university and I, I started forgetting why I was doing what I was doing. So I felt that there was a big need for me to prove myself. Just before my 40s, uh, I had also started having this feeling like you could have done better, you know. And I didn't even want to celebrate my 40th birthday because I felt like you're just a, at 40, you're still a bundle of potentials. People still talk to you and they say, oh, she's got potentials. And when people talk about other people, they're talking about their achievements. You know, what started happening to me was that um, whatever I had done before, that um, gave me so much confidence. At that point in time, I wasn't saying those things. You know, I stopped saying all the good because 
th those things were not good enough for me anymore. And because they were not good enough for me, I felt not good enough. I joined City Church and we started going for gospel community. And in one of them, at the beginning, there was this um, book, this study we're doing, The Gospel-Centered Life. And I remember I would get into the gospel community. The gospel-centered life made people talk. And not just made people talk, it made people talk about their weaknesses, their failures, failings. And I would listen. And at first, because I, I, I felt like a pretty good Christian. And truthfully, if you ask me for my weaknesses those days, it would take time to, you know, I wasn't just because I, I saw myself as a good Christian, like, Kemi, you're doing well, you're doing great, okay? So, <laughs> um, people will talk and I'll listen to them, and sometimes they will ask me to pray, I'll pray for them, you know? <laughs> and um, until, after a few times, I remember this cross chart that we were looking at. There was this chart, and the chart reminded us that if you if you if you were growing in awareness of God's holiness, then you would be aware of your faults and your sins. And it brought to mind, um, you know, scriptures like uh, some prophets uh, seeing God and then just saying, "I'm unholy." You know, sometimes it's because we've not really, we don't really know who God is. And we think that his holiness is like our own standard of holiness. So we feel good, you know, and that really started um, getting to my mind, changing me, making me to start praying. And then I, this, one of my favorite prayers was, Lord, open my eyes to see. And God answers such prayers. And God started opening my eyes. I must tell you, it wasn't always very pretty when God opened my eyes. Like, oh, like can we look at you, what you did. You, I'm like, oh gosh, I have the capacity to do all these things. And it wasn't, it wasn't really the, it wasn't the easiest experience for me. But then I also had to turn back to God and start to ask him to help me. It was in one of those gospel communities, you know, that I found out when we're talking about um, orphans and children, that I had an orphan mentality about performing, about, you know, just trying to do things to, to get something, and that I didn't have a the mentality of a child of God that I didn't I didn't have it the way I wanted to have it and I remember it was one of those moments and everybody was talking and I did not know when I told them that I made uh, I went to school and it was a third class that I finished with and I remember I think I cried a little but then I felt like a heavy weight was off me you know I didn't really have to pretend to be the smartest person in the room I wasn't actually <laughs> or to be smart or anything but it was it was the beginning of God working in me to I can I use the word to strip me of everything I could trust in aside from him to really take my identity from him to take my confidence from him being my father my source and everything and not just in not just delighting in the things I could do or you know in this world why I'm sharing this and one you know it was just this year uh, that I started to feel like wow, something has really happened within me because uh, I had this experience that normally would have broken me, you know, and I think I expected it to break me a bit. I didn't realize that I had outgrown some things. I had this experience with someone you, you know, I wanted favor from and someone who was happy with me, you know, someone really um, highly placed in the society, but there was a misunderstanding. And the person made a statement like, uh, oh, I thought I was dealing with people of integrity. You know, they thought they were dealing with someone of people of integrity like themselves. And, you know, if someone had said that to me, even last year, I would really feel pained. You know, I feel like, I had failed because if there was something that gave me confidence it was my character. It was my being a good person. And so here was someone discrediting me. And I found out that I was okay. 
So I came to my husband. I said, look what has happened. This person is very sad about this. And I'm sad that this happened. But guess what? I'm okay. I don't feel like entering the ground. You know, I don't, I, I, I can't feel that cringe, that cringing feeling, that, that feeling of, oh, like I'm cringing. This is what they are thinking about me. And that wasn't the first time something like that would happen that year but that was a major one and that made me feel and I just I left my husband and I was just full of praise and thanksgiving to God that this thing I've been praying about it's happening it's happening I'm growing you know I'm growing my identity I can see that this thing is real I'm, you know not just in my head you know now it's translated to the way I feel that my identity is really in Christ Jesus. And that has really affected the way I do my work, how I relate with other people. I'm extremely grateful to God for his work in my life. This story reminds me of this song we sing in church. You are a good, good father to you all, to you all, and I'm loved by you. And we can be grateful to God because he sees our flaws, he sees our inadequacies. He knew we were not good enough, and yet he said, I choose you, I love you. And um, it's, it's that love that made him send Jesus, whose birth we are celebrating today. I hope this story inspired you and it also ministered to you. I don't know if there's anything like too many songs in a Christmas carol service. Carols mean songs. They are, they are together. So we'll be singing two songs together and then we'll uh, see how Christmas goes down in another family.
angels will appear on high.
Jollof rice or fried rice? Jollof rice. Christmas light or Christmas tree? Christmas tree. Red or green? Green. green. Chicken or turkey? Chicken. Turkey. Christmas lunch or dinner? Christmas dinner. Vanilla Christmas cake or chocolate Christmas cake? Chocolate Christmas cake. Cake or cookies? Cake. cake. Not Paul or Bethlehem? Not Bethlehem. Christmas at home with presents or in Disneyland without presents? Christmas at home with presents. Christmas movies or Christmas songs? Christmas songs. Who has it harder during the holidays? Parents, the parents or children? The parents. parents. Finish the thought. It wouldn't be Christmas without... Jollof rice. Family. It won't be Christmas. Christmas tree. Presents. Without presents. Okay. Do you guys have a favorite Christmas song? Feliz Navidad. Okay. Can we sing it? Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Prosperous amigos, Felicidad. <laughs> All right, okay. Um, Isabella and um, Elisa, what gift do they have taken to baby Jesus in the manger? I'll give baby Jesus a daddy bear and blessings. I'll have given him golden mask and golden teddy bear. Golden teddy bear. Golden teddy bear. And right. he it. <laughs> If your Christmas tree could talk, what do you think it's going to say? Why decorate me. Decorate Why me. Why am I here? I need more lights. Why am I being decorated? Why if you decorate. had to pick any month to celebrate Christmas, what would it be? January. January. Why? July. Because it's Isabella's birthday. It's the first month of the year. Okay. Uncle Mosh, what are you looking forward to this year's Christmas? So I'm looking forward to joy, peace, celebrations, time with the family. Making sure that everybody's happy and lots of parties with your love rice. <laughs> okay, if you guys could spend Christmas anywhere in the world, where would it be? France. Okay, how do you guys celebrate Christmas as a family? So, um, normally what we do is that um, um, the week preceding to Christmas, we would usually buy gifts. In fact, from the beginning of December, we buy like one gift per day for the children. Might be something small, but something useful. So you store up enough gifts up until Christmas morning, and then on Christmas day they kind of open, sit around the tree, they open presents either on 25th or 26th. But 25th, basically, it's time with family. Uh, we go for parties with um, the extended family, more like a reunion with everybody. So you see people that you have not seen in a long time. You want to say what? How do you spend your Christmas? Well, spend Christmas going to my grandma's house and playing games we wonder um we act plays and we go shopping to buy um gifts and toys and, and we wrap them up and then sometimes we play hide and seek if you guys could give your parents any gifts what would it be give them the gift of god two million nine hundred and fifty five thousand <laughs> I'll give them the gift of God. Okay. Okay, so everybody, Merry Christmas in French. Dry Dry and well. Well. There's a song I always look forward to in Christmas carols. It's like that song teleports me to the night Jesus was born. Like, like I was there. We'll be singing Silent Night. And as you flow with the lyrics, hopefully, you'll be teleported too. And after that, We'd have a Bible reading and the Word of God will be preached to us by our lead pastor, Femi Oshuni, after which we'd have a congregational prayer.
The third Bible reading is taken from John 12, verse 47. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Hi everyone. Have you been enjoying the singing so far? I know it's a bit awkward. What kind of carol service is this? Where we can't gather together, we can't, you know, sing songs and hear our nice voices sometimes and our terrible voices on the other hand. You know, it's been that kind of a year where everything has been transformed. Which is why I think this has been one of the most anticipated Christmases in a long time. You know, we've had to deal with so much suffering in this uh, year. We've had to deal with so much disappointment, so many unexpected things. I don't know, you may be watching here and this year actually COVID took someone away from you. Or it was somebody or was some other way that you lost the person. Can I offer my apologies? Um, I know my family, my wife's family lost someone through COVID and that was a very difficult experience. And so as I said, that's why we anticipate Christmas. Some of us have said, man, this end of the year, I don't care what they say. I am going to party hard. This dirty December, right, they, they have not found the soap to be able to wash it away. And so many of us are anticipating Christmas. For us, Christmas is just going to be that release of suffering from the year 2020 as we anticipate 2021. But as many of us would know, if you've been Christians for any period of time, at Christmas, we celebrate the coming of Christ. So what does that really mean? Who is meant to tell us what it means? Because many times we define the meaning for ourselves. Is that the way it should be? My sister-in-law recently uh, marked her birthday, a significant birthday in her life. And she didn't want to do anything at first. In fact, she had a last minute decision the night before to do something. So she could only call a few friends that were living around because there were some restrictions that were going on at the time. Now, what she didn't know was that somebody was coming to her house to come and pick up something. So at the time, you know, some of her friends were around, you know, the place was vibing a little bit. Again, we were all social distancing was was uh, was uh, um, social distancing? How do I say it? Social. We 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 abided by all social distancing laws. Okay, just say anyway. The place was vibing, so this person comes in and she sees him and she's like, "Ah, you came." I didn't know, and then he's looking a bit confused. Later he realizes. He said, "Oh, my birthday! I didn't know. How did you find out?" And he later realized that that wasn't why he came. He told her, this isn't why I came. And eventually told her why he came, which was to pick up a cake for another birthday he was going to. In other words, he told her why he didn't come and then proceeded to tell her why he came. Of course, trust is a Niger bachelor. The guy still stayed, waited, ate, and then went. And it's very, very similar. You see, when it comes to Christmas, Jesus tells us in numerous passages why he did not come. And then he tells us why he came. And so in the three verses that we've read in our readings, this carol service, you see Jesus tells us why he didn't come. And later he tells us why he came. And I want us to quickly look at those things. Why did Jesus or why didn't Jesus come? Well, in John 6, 38, he tells us that I have come down from heaven not to do my will. In other words, though Jesus came from heaven, he's telling us, I didn't come to do my will. Which, if we can translate, means I didn't come on my own authority. Why is that important for you and I? Well, if he didn't come on his authority, he certainly isn't here on our authority. That reminds me of when I was in my teens, as many of us used to uh, do, when a visitor came, they told us to go and buy drinks for them, soft drinks, otherwise known as minerals. So I would go. And many times in the estate that we were living in, I would see my friends. They would either be playing football or they would be playing table tennis. And then they would invite me to come and join them. Usually I would like to, but I couldn't. You know why? Because when I went out, I did not go out on my authority, neither did I go out on my friend's authority. Therefore, I could not, on that authority, do my own will or their own will. 
Jesus didn't come on his own authority. He came not to do his will. I know sometimes we hear certain teachings which tell us that God has set certain principles in motion. And on the basis of that, in some way we can command God or we can command Jesus because we are exercising the believer's authority. But we don't really have that authority to do that. If Jesus can say he did not come on his own authority, then certainly he did not come on our own authority. That's not why he came. But also in Matthew 20, verse 28, he tells us another thing. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, he did not come to be served. In other words, he did not come for his own benefit. And therefore, he did not come for your own self-defined benefit. One of the things that we have found in this COVID environment, in this COVID world, is difficult to get a job. I know if you didn't have a job before, you know, it's really difficult getting a job now. But you know what, here in Lagos and in many parts of the country, and maybe you're even watching from outside the country, but particularly here in Lagos, one of the things that we know before COVID and after COVID is this. Most people get jobs <laughs> through who they know. It's called, the, it's called the arm of God, but the leg of man, right? We try to get jobs through who we know. In fact, sometimes people drop their CVs for me and just speak to one of your friends. Now, many times, the funny thing is that people actually try to apply for jobs that they are not qualified for. They don't even know, you know, an engineer is applying for some kind of economics job. They don't even care. They just want a job. They're not qualified for the job, but they just want it. And then the question becomes, who is that benefiting? Well, it certainly isn't benefiting the firm that they are trying to work at. It is benefiting themselves alone. Well, this is the same context that we find this Matthew 20 because James and John's mom is trying to seek a job for her sons. She, they, she asked Jesus in his kingdom, can they sit on the right or on the left? The question is, why is she saying that? It's not really for the benefit of the kingdom because she really doesn't understand how that works. It's really for the benefit of her children and for herself. But Jesus says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served. When he says Son of Man, he's referring to a divine being seen in Daniel chapter 7. He said, even as a divine person, I did not come to the earth on Christmas day to be served. I did not come for my own benefit. How much more when we think about our own self-defined benefit? Many times we say something like, you know, God just looks at my heart. He doesn't really care about all these sins. He's a God of grace. Jesus is a God of grace. What he does care about is that I don't suffer at all. What he does care about is that I won't remain single at all. What he does care about is that I would make even more money than I've ever made. Let us be careful to know that if he didn't come for his own benefit, he didn't come for our own self-defined benefit. Why else didn't Jesus come? He says in John 12, 47, he says, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world. By that he's saying those who do not obey him, Jesus is saying that his coming at Christmas wasn't for the purpose of judging, of condemning the world. What does that mean? As you apply it to yourself, I'm sure many of us will want to do that. But can I say, if Jesus hasn't come to condemn you, then he hasn't come to condemn your enemies as well. Far too often we judge our goodness by comparing ourselves with people we feel we are better and this makes us uglier people. It makes us judgmental people. It makes us people who constantly, you know, try to bring people down, constantly try to blame people for why they are the way they are. 
and constantly not able to look at our own selves. Many times, maybe if somebody has wronged us, we take them into our judicial court. We sentence them. We put them in prison. We bring them out, take them to the court again. We sentence them. We take them to prison over and over again. We condemn them. And also, some others, is the converse. It's not people. It's yourself. You dwell in so much self-pity and self-hatred. You look at the standards society has set for you or you have set for yourself and you keep judging yourself over and over and over again. And if you no one can understand you. Can I say whether it is that we condemn others or we condemn ourselves, Jesus is not our ally. Why? He did not come at Christmas to judge the world. Stop calling upon God. Stop calling upon Jesus to strike down your enemies. He isn't our ally in condemning the world. Because he says clearly, I did not come to judge the world at Christmas. So why then did he come? See, in all three verses, he tells us why he came. First of all, when we think about John 6, 38, when he says that he did not come to do his own will, notice what he then says. He says, but to do the will of the one who sent me. Where, what does that mean? Now, where can we find that? Well, just look at the two verses after that in John 6, 39 to 40. He says, and this is the will of him who sent me that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Jesus came on a rescue mission. His Father sent him on a rescue mission, and it has to do with the last day. The final day. Think about it for those of us who have kids. Whenever we think about our kids, quite frankly, we are not thinking only about what they will do tomorrow. In fact, if you have help, you're, they know what to do for the next day. Yes, we may think about little things here and there, but quite frankly, when we think about our kids, we think about their future. What will they become? And we plan based on that. We start to put them in this kind of school. We start to give them these kinds of books. We start to teach them in the, um, you know, about the Bible, give them certain morals. Why? We are not thinking about their tomorrow. We are thinking about their future. We are not thinking about the next day. We are thinking about the next decade. Well, God, who is the true Father, is not thinking about your next year. Neither is he just thinking about the next decade, God is thinking about the last day. That's why he sends Jesus. He's thinking in the longest of terms. He's thinking in eternal terms. That is why he sends Jesus. You see, the future Christianity offers you isn't just living forever. But as it says here, to be raised up, to be resurrected. In other words, we all will taste death. But if you look to the Son and believe in Him, the Son whom the Father sent to come and do His will, on the last day, He's saying, He's going to give you not just the ability to live forever, but to live in a way that you will never taste death again. If you tasted death and He raises you up on the last day, you will never taste death again. In fact, you will not taste death again. You will live with Him forever in a new world that He creates. It's a magnificent thing. But then what else about the last day? Remember he says, Jesus said he did not come to judge the world. But in Matthew 16, verse 27, listen to what he says. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, Paul urges Timothy to preach the word, but the charge, he said, is before God and before Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his coming. So he is going to judge the world. 
when he comes. But he says that he's not come to judge the world. And the reason is because it is on the last day that he will judge the world. And some will not have a good on that day. And then you say, why is that a good thing to say? Well, a good ju God will judge. Think about it. When we find a criminal, in our society and they are brought before the judge if somebody has murdered someone what does the judge do he's not just judging him based on his crime when he sentences him he puts him in prison in other words he's saying based on the crime you committed you are not only just wrong but you are wrong to be in this society because your crime is trying to destroy the society. Well, when Jesus comes, he is trying to save the world. He's going to renew the world. He's going to raise people up and create a vast new wonderful kingdom. But for those who continue to sin and rebel against him, he's going to say, not only are you wrong, but if you are in this world, you are going to destroy the new world that I'm making. And so he judges. But notice though, if he did not come to judge the world at Christmas, because that is on when he returns, there's a second coming. That's when he judges. If he did not come to judge, then what did he come to do? He said he came to save the world. You see, when he comes and returns and judges, he's going to save the world, world fully. But when he came at Christmas, how did he save the world? Well, that takes us back to the final place, isn't it? He said, he did not come to serve, to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus offers his life for us in death so that he can give us eternal life to never taste death again. In Christmas, the rescue mission was that God said, this child in a manger is going to become a king on a cross because he's going to die for all those who then look to him. They look to him because they put their sins upon him. And I like going to restaurants with my wife and part of the reasons I like going to restaurants, not just the food, is to be waited on. And think about what waiters do. The waiter serves us so that we won't have to serve ourselves. The waiter stands up so that we can sit down. A waiter brings food so that we can eat. A waiter moves around so that we can relax. In other words, a waiter serves us with his life so that we can also enjoy life. Jesus does far more than what the waiter does. Jesus offers his life for us. That is why he came. He came to save us, he came to serve you. That's why Christmas is such a wonderful time. I hope you can receive this Jesus that came in Christmas. This Jesus who has not yet come to judge. This Jesus who didn't come to do his will. This Jesus who came to do the will of the Father, this Jesus who came to save you. I hope you not just sing the carols for a good atmosphere and a good time, for a good nostalgic time, but you sing the carols in anticipation of Jesus' return because you are celebrating that he first came. Why don't you receive Jesus? Why don't you receive Jesus today? He is waiting. He, will not, he doesn't want to lose you if you look unto him. I pray that that would be how we embrace this Christmas. God bless you. Now I'm just going to hand over to the person who is going to lead us in congregational prayer. Father, we are thankful that your first response to our sin was a promise that it would not keep us apart forever. Thank you for choosing from the very beginning to send Jesus to make a way to restore us into a loving relationship with you. As we celebrate his birth this year, give us a deeper revelation of what you accomplished as he came into the world. 
Let us experience the joy you felt when Jesus was born and the fulfillment of your promise was set in motion. He has come to bruise the head of the serpent and we celebrate our freedom to worship you with reverence. We cannot begin to fathom how you wove history together to become his story ages before he was born. We, your church, are in awe of your infinite power and wisdom. Thank you for the miracle of your son. Help us to never lose sight of how great you are. The virgin conceived and bore a son. And what a marvel and what a comfort Emmanuel has been to us. As you fulfilled your promises to your children through the ages, so your children today look to you for the same fulfillment. Thank you for your faithfulness in easy and in difficult times. Thank you for your wisdom in using difficult seasons for a greater purpose. Help us to trust you more and more and to know the honor of being part of the work that brings you so much glory. Lord, we pray that you would use all of our imperfections, all of our weaknesses for your glory. Give purpose to our small and often misdirected ambitions. No matter where we started, Lord, shepherd us to the places you want us to go. Let all who love your work renew their strength in you, O God. Help them to support the mission of spreading the good news of Jesus. Provide for them so their generous hearts will find full expression in generous giving. For all the churches who have supported us, our church plants, for all the individuals in this ministry who have been generous, Lord, we pray that you bless and replenish them in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up our city and our nation before you. We pray that our city will come to know the reality of your gospel. Let your children speak aloud of your covenant love and your faithfulness. Let them testify of their salvation. Let our local assemblies preach the gospel and let their members adorn it with lives that reflect your goodness, your kindness, your compassion, your love. And let your holiness be beautiful to all who encounter Christians in this city of Lagos. Lord, we pray that all who serve the people in government, in the public sphere, realize that they are out there to help the people to flourish. As the ancient of days came to rule over Israel, we pray that the world, uh, that the leaders in, in, in our city today would know that the government is truly upon our Savior's shoulder and help them to draw wisdom, inspiration, and strength from him. May our city come to know peace as the Prince of Peace reigns in our land. O Son of Righteousness, the world needs your healing rays. From our hearts to our bodies, we need you to cleanse us of hatred and despair of disease and sickness oh balm of gilead you appeared one time to take away sin lord we pray that you take away our sickness too as you show your kind heart when you went about doing good healing the nation of israel when you were alive seeking those who needed you so we pray you would seek all those who need you lord in our world today everyone who is lost everyone who is fearful everyone who is consumed by hatred and who is sick in their souls but also everyone that is ravaged by disease, by COVID, by cancer. Lord, we pray you would stretch out your hand to heal and to make whole. Lord, make us your children, your sons and daughters, servants of the Most High God. Help us to be joyful partners in this mission of mercy and relief. May we go with the joy and power of the gospel. May we boldly proclaim salvation and healing in your name. May we cause the worship of the one true King to ring out in every home and in every square. May we all joyfully say together that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. Lord, we pray all this, we ask all this in the name of your precious Son, even Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
Leben. Oh nein, die It is time for us, uh, when I mean us, I mean the male singers and the bad singers to have the floor. We are going to be having a Christmas karaoke. If you're in a watch party, this is the time to know the true Christmas people. Children, this is the time to know whether mommy and daddy, if, if they know these Christmas songs. And peradventure, if you're watching this alone, this is the time to have a non-bedroom singing section. Guys, this moment comes once in a year. Let's, let's seize it on. You know all right after this please put your dancing shoes on your christmas caps on anything that just makes you feel christmasy and your carol voice on for the last time as we'll be concluding with a christmas medley all right i will be leaving you with this uh cliche christmas statement christ is the reason for the season merry christmas
Well, we've come to the end of this carol service, this virtual carol service, which we hope <laughs> never to repeat again. But has it not been a wonderful time? And you know, for this kind of thing to happen, it requires a lot of work. And I always have to say thank you to the people that have done this. First of all, thank you for joining. Thank you for watching. Thank you for singing. Thank you for gathering your family around. Thank you for supporting us actually watching. This was an experiment that we wanted to try. Um, so thank you. Thank you for attending virtually. But also I do want to thank the music team. First of all, the singers. Our singers comprise not just of people who are employed on staff, but also people who um, volunteer. You know, thank you to all the guys that you saw volunteering. It's not easy because they work and they still have to rehearse at the same time. Thank you guys for all that you do. I do want to thank the staff singers as well. Yes, it's their job, but this is always a unique time. It's always busier at this period. So they also always give extra sacrifice, you know, uh, for the carol. And it is a form of them also serving us because we know we always want carols, right, don't we? But I do also want to thank their two leaders as well, Kunle and, um, and uh, Elijah. Elijah works with the instrumentals, Kunle works with the voice. It's not just in the sense of them uh, training, it's, it's picking the songs, it's the, the arrangement, all of those things. Kunle and Elijah, God bless you guys. Thank you for your labor of love and thank you for using the skill that God has given you. I want to thank all the people who have participated in the, you know, who have volunteered, whether it's in reading, whether it's in coordinating, everyone that has participated in this service. I also want to thank our wonderful, wonderful operations manager, Kwelumi, who oversees the operations of everything and puts this thing together. We all know what a gift, a gem she is to this church. But you know, it's a virtual service. It's a virtual carol service. We're not physically here, which means right now as I'm speaking, there are a few people that are behind the camera who have done so much to put this together. Let me start with Laito, or Laito Akitude. Laito does our camera work. He does a lot of the video editing. So not only is he you know, recording me right now, he's going to have to take this video and take so many other people's videos, put them together, put words, all of these wonderful things. Light or thank you, thank you for all that you do. And then there are two others who, at the moment of this, are already one at this period, that's uh, Tomwa and Victoria. I'll start with Tomwa. Tomwa leads our creative team and he's, you know, the ideas guy, he's the visual guy. And, um, uh, he never liked the idea of the, no, he, he never uh, liked the idea of the, car, the virtual carol service, but he had to do it anyway. And it's not just thanking him for uh, this particular carol service, but thanking him for all that he's done throughout this year. And finally, I want to thank Victoria. The reason why I left her for last is because the whole schedule was put, this whole carol schedule was put together by her. And many of the choices, many of the the things, the videos that you've seen, all of these things were her idea. And she's put such a wonderful carol service together. So I hope you thank all these people well for me. I hope you are filled with gratitude for what the Lord has done. Now, if you have not been, you are not a member of City Church or you don't attend City Church, can I invite you to? Can I invite you to join us? Maybe you're not going to a church. Uh, maybe you're looking for a church. Can I invite you to join us? We uh, meet every Sunday, 7.45, 9.45. If you are outside of Lagos, uh, outside of the country, can I say that our 9.45 service is actually broadcast? But if you're in Lagos, we're not an online church. We're a physically gathering church. So we want you to join us either at 7.45 or 9.45. Meet at City Lodge Hotel at Lekki here. I would love for you to join our community. We believe in um, the renewal of the city of Lagos through a gospel-centered movement. We want to see our city renewed spiritually, socially, culturally. There's so many things that um, I think you'll benefit if you joined us. But we also want to benefit from having you serve us with your own gifts. So if you want to know more about us, just check us out at City Church Lagos on all social media. 
platforms, particularly Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But if you want to listen to some of our messages, just visit our podcast. It's called The Gospel in Lagos on all major um, uh, podcast platforms. And you can check out our teaching podcast called Theology in Lagos. We'll be so happy and so glad to have you. And if you want to bless this ministry, maybe you've been blessed in times past, well, the link to give is also uh, provided on screen. And then we also have account details that can assist you with that. Thank you for being so generous. Uh, remembering that at Christmas, God gave generously his son. Uh, we know you don't have to give out of compulsion, uh, but we'll be glad to receive your gifts anyway. Now, all that remains is for me to give you this Christmas benediction. It's a little bit long, but I think it's very powerful. So can we all rise up as we hear these words to us? Let us go from this place proclaiming that we have been seen and known of God, believing that his light shines in our inner darkness so that our light may shine in outer darkness. Let us go from this place Proclaiming that Jesus who came in a manger is that light. He came before and is coming again. And may the love of the Creator, the joy of the Spirit, and the peace of the Christ child be with you this Christmas and forevermore. To which we all say, Amen. God bless you. Have a merry, merry Christmas. <music>